Welcome guys, it's Matmus. Thank you so much for joining me on today's video. I really do appreciate it. So today we are talking about something a little different than what we usually used to talking about on my channel with main battle tanks. We are talking about the impressive, the gigantic, and the beastly AS-90 Braveheart self-propelled howitzer. Now this thing is unreal. When I was in the British Army, it literally was one of those vehicles that when you see coming, you kind of want to crawl into a hole and die. It is just huge. Um, I'm six foot three guys, and when I used to get into the back of these things to do repairs or look around, I literally could stand inside of it and my head wouldn't even be close with my helmet to the top of the ceiling of this damn thing. It is huge, uh, and it needs to be to encompass that massive gun sitting inside of it. Now this vehicle is obviously running along the shoot and scoot maneuver tactic, which basically means the artillerymen are able to place rounds onto targets and then be able to get out of that area as quickly as possible to react to potential counter battery fire, which in today's modern conflicts is very, very important and something that's very prominent on the battlefield. We want to be able to put rounds down range and bug out as quickly as possible. Now this vehicle was designed very, very well. It was to replace an older vehicle. And what we're going to do, first of all, before we go into the technicalities of how I feel about this vehicle, we're going to go over a really quick overview of what this thing's about and kind of features and specifications it has. Just to give you a bit of an idea of how this thing works, how it came to be, and why it is in service within the British Army and other countries worldwide. So, the AS-90, otherwise known as the British AS-90 self-propelled 155mm gun, was a replacement for the British Army's aging American-designed M109 and FE-433 Abbott 105mm artillery systems. Vickers Shipbuilding Engineering, which was brought out by BAE Systems Land Systems in 1999, originally developed it in 1981. The 1981 project built a prototype 155mm turret designated the GBT-155. A new 155mm self-propelled artillery system project was started and designated the AS-90, which stands for Artillery System for, surprisingly enough, the 1990s. Two prototypes were built in 1986 and entered the British Army service in the Abbott Replacement Competition. In 1989, the AS-90 was chosen as the British Army's new artillery system, and an order was made to Vickers for 179 AS-90s guys, at a cost of an astonishing £300 million. That's a lot of money for the British Army. First deliveries were made in 1993 and were completed in roughly 1995. The AS-90's engine is a 660 horsepower V8 diesel engine from the Cummings, with a ZF Gears Limited automatic transmission with 4 forward and 2 reverse gears, giving a top road speed of 55 km an hour and an operational range of 370 km. The AS-90 is lightly armoured and is welded with a 17mm thick steel armour construction. It is then pretty much capable to defend itself from its own indirect fire from counter battery effects, but only within reason and only within certain distances. However, there is in current development new armour to allow the AS-90 to withstand anti-tank missiles and heavier rounds than its current protection against 7.62mm and 14.5mm armour piercing shells, as well as 152mm shell fragments. It also has its own smoke discharges and obviously an MBC system in case of nuclear, biological and chemical attack. The AS-90s are fitted with a 155mm gun, 39 calibre length main gun, which fires NATO L15 155mm projectiles with a range of 24.7km using conventional, notice I say conventional, ammunition. The AS-90 also fires extended range ammunition rounds to around 30km. It has a fire rate of 3 rounds in 10 seconds in burst fire mode and 6 rounds per minute for 3 minutes in intense firing and 2 rounds per minute for 60 minutes at sustained fire. It carries 48 rounds. 31 of these are stored in the turret bustle magazine. The gun layer station is equipped with a direct fire sight from Avimo, now part of Thales Optronics. And we already know who Thales is guys, they pretty much develop most Optronics for any kind of vehicles out there today. For direct night firing. For indirect firing, an automatic gun laying system or AGLS with an electronic elevation and traverse drive provide laying accuracy of one mile and rapid target engagement. The layers display unit or LDU was designed by VSEL. 
the commander station is equipped with a separate site. Basically guys, this particular system allows the crew to punch in coordinates as they're moving. Okay, so it has its own specified systems in place, gyroscopes, GPS systems and such, that it can actually allow the commander and the gunner to put in coordinates, punch them in as the driver's punching as fast as he can across the battlefield to get to his next firing location. And as soon as they pull up on site, Enter it into the ballistics computer, gun can traverse 360 degrees wherever it needs to go, elevate, fire, as many rounds as they need to do, close barrel, off they go, and then jobs are good. It's fantastic technology and something that is obviously apparent to nearly all mobile field artillery systems nowadays. There's also a barrel cooling system to provide higher maximum fire rates in development. It also has a 7.62mm L7 GPMG mounted on the commander's turret for close protection. So reloading of this thing guys is pretty self-explanatory, quite simple. Uh, it does have a very large bulkhead at the back, bulkhead door, that is able to allow gun crews to replenish ammunition quite easily from the rear. Um, there was a system in place that they were trying to trial to be able to do an automatic loading uh, system into this vehicle, but it was declined uh, for reasons unknown. It was basically, I would go along the thinking of they probably wanted to side towards human control over an auto loading system that could potentially fail uh, and honestly I kind of agree with that I prefer to stick with troops getting shells in the back than a system that fails and then they have to get mechanics to come out to fix that system when you're talking about ammunition as well I mean once you're trying to push bag charges and shells of that caliber and that size through little ports in the back of the vehicle to try and get it you know auto loaded I'd much rather troops just hand load it and carefully cautiously put them into the breach and into the, well, not to the breaches, into the uh, magazine safely, um, which is nice to see. You know, it's just nice to have sort of gunners doing the job instead of machines all the time. Um, so it's pretty neat to have that kind of reloading structure in place. I used to remember the Royal Logistics Corps when they pulled up behind these things and just unloading racks and racks of these brown gun tube ammunition racks and. By the end of the day, normally when they finished their gun days, I mean, they were just completely dry. There was nothing left. They'd just punch through every single round they could get. Because training days for these things are just like, I mean, it's like a kid in a candy store. The gunners like to get their hands on the kit and get the rounds down range. And as you can see here, the boys are just tearing through that ammunition as quickly as they can. Now, it really doesn't seem like a very difficult task trying to get shells in there. As I said before, that rear bulkhead door is nice and big, nice big opening to get those rounds in. And obviously, it's going to take time like any kind of reloading would. But uh, they've also mentioned in the past that uh, this vehicle is actually quite easily to uh, maintain. I would strongly disagree with that. I've maintained these vehicles up and down, and they are not fun to change however normally a power pack change is going to happen in about an hour's time if everything works out nicely which is pretty good considering i mean it's a little less time than the challenger 2 um but this vehicle is designed a little differently to the challenger 2 this uses a caliper system to brake uh, instead of the braking system that's used in the challenger 2 which uses oil and brake bands very different system um so yeah so there were a few different variations of this gun um, system that were placed. The British AS-90D self-propelled gun is the desert version. Basically it gives it some extra thermal protection for the five-man crew, some extra cooling for the engine and the machinery and such. Uh, and the tracks were also given specific uh, modifications for the desert environment. Uh, the British AS-90 Braveheart um, was created by BA Systems and was awarded the contract to upgrade 96 of the AS-90s to a 52 caliber length gun to increase its unassisted range to 30 kilometers with a long range ERA ammunition to 40 kilometers. So they've just bumped up the range even further and 40 kilometers for 155 millimeters of hot metal is pretty darn impressive. The project was cancelled by the British Army due to technical problems with the ammunition. It is assumed that the turret was modified to take the extra weight from the increased length of the main gun and changes to the breach and ammunition stowage, hence the name Braveheart Turret. Now this system is still being worked on concurrently guys, I actually have a couple of friends in the Royal Artillery uh, who work on this particular weapon system. They are still working on different upgrades for the barrel uh, and the, actually there's different systems they're putting in, in place of the GPS too uh, to try and lay on more accurate fire. But this gun can be upgraded to make it big and be able to punch rounds further. So it's a nice feature to have if they require it. For the most part, they stick to the standard gun. Um, Britain is the main operator of the AS-90. Um, it operates six field regiments. Three of these regiments are under the command of the 1st Armoured Division in Germany. Uh, however, that's changing as of right now back into the UK. 
uh, and three are under the command of the Third Armoured Division in the UK. Now, the structure in the UK is changing very, very quickly and all over the place, and not something I really want to talk about because it makes me very, very sad. Um, but the Braveheart was also trialled in Sweden, and the turret fitted to a T-72 hull for trials in India, which is very interesting. The AS-90 has not been exported as a whole vehicle to any country, however the Braveheart turret is scheduled to be under license in Poland as part of their new Crab SPG using a German 155mm caliber length with a 52 cal length main gun. So what's my opinion on this vehicle then? Well, overall, I honestly have a lot of respect for the AS-90. It's one of those vehicles that I've always liked to have on my side. Um, we all know that modern technology and modern battlefield techniques are changing in regards to artillery. We know there's the counter-battery radar, counter-battery systems that are able to engage artillery pretty much straight away when that round gets fired out of the barrel. And we're able to locate artillery positions and fire back at them quite quickly. The shoot and scoop maneuver is slowly starting to become something of the past, with air superiority being able to find these assets very, very quickly, counter battery uh, radar being able to locate the rounds coming in very quick. However, I think the AS90 still has a long way to go. It has a lot of features that are able to keep it on the battlefield with that 30 to 40 kilometer range. I mean, that is a fantastic fire base that it's able to produce. The British Army clearly wants to keep it in service. It's still running today. The MO D is still pumping money into it, which is really, really nice to see. 155mm cannon is going to be a fantastic asset to have on your side, whether it's mobile or stationary. With the AS-90 being able to do the shoot and scoot maneuver, I really do think in potential modern day conflicts, it still has a lot of potential and a, you know, the ability to provide good artillery support. Uh, I do remember in my day looking after these vehicles in terms of maintenance, they did pretty good for themselves. I'm not going to lie, they did pretty good. They weren't as bad as, you know, Challenger 2's power pack failure rate was a lot more than the AS-90's, but this had a very different system in place. The gunners I spoke to in my army career absolutely loved this vehicle and honestly guys, hands down, I love it too. I love the fact that it is part of my uh, you know, patriotic country's military force and I'm proud to say that I've served alongside it in my army career. Anyway guys, I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Please leave a like and if you enjoyed the video, uh, some sort of comment to let me know. And if you're new to my channel, please subscribe. I hope you enjoyed. Please, please, please have a great day. All the best and bye bye.